Hello, Slush. Hey. I am Mikko Hyppönen, and I am a goddamn dinosaur. Looking at the most exciting people, the most exciting startups here at Slush, I think the most exciting people are born in 1990s. That's what I feel after spending a while walking around here. Well, I wasn't born in 1990s. I wasn't born in 1980s. I wasn't even born in 1970s. I'm from 1960s. And I realized this last month when I was looking at the history of the internet. Because many of us know that the internet was invented in the United States by the US military. They invented the TCP IP protocol, which later was then expanded to do things like the web. So while the internet is an American innovation, the web is a European innovation, which is great. So before the internet, we had ARPANET. And ARPANET turned 45 years last month. So in effect, the internet is 45 years old. So the internet was born in 1969, like I was born in 1969. And 1969 was a great year. Not only did we, the mankind, invent the internet, we also went to the moon. And we had this rock and roll co uh, concert called the Woodstock. Yay! And of course, I was born, which was nice. But these 45 years, have really been a wild ride. They've really changed the world. The internet is really changing everything. And the pace is just getting quicker and quicker. And I realized this myself very well in May. Because in May, on the May 12th, I believe, I was driving to work. I live in Espo, so I drive to work to our headquarters, the f -Secure headquarters, every morning through the Länsiväylä Highway, which has been voted the most beautiful commute in Finland as it connects from bridge to a bridge through islands by the archipelago. And while I drive that highway, I drive by the headquarters of Nokia. And of course, Nokia changed as a company because of the internet. Nokia was our main exporter for almost 20 years. Their main export was mobile phones. Before Nokia, the main export of Finland was paper, pulp, wood, forest machines, pulp factories. So everything related to, to forests, because we have a lot of forests. Those of the foreigners might have recognized this when you landed to the Helsinki airport. If you looked out the window, all you see is forests. But for this brief window, 20 years, our main export was mobile phones. Now, when people, everybody around the world were using Nokia phones, everything was fine. But then the internet came around. The web really became commonplace. And people wanted to surf the web from their phones. And that's where Nokia started tumbling. And that all ended then in May, when the sale of Nokia mobile phones was finalized to Microsoft. So on May 12th, when I drove by the headquarters, I saw that the logo on the side, side of the Nokia headquarters had changed from Nokia to Microsoft. Quite interestingly, on the very same day, there was another big news in Finnish financial media. And that was that a company called Metsa Group has announced that they start building a new pulp factory in central Finland, a billion euro pulp factory, making pulp. Which makes no sense, because we don't really use paper much anymore. We read our news from our phones, from our tablets, from our computers instead of newspapers. We read our books on iPads and Kindles. But there turns out that that pulp factory isn't making pulp for paper. It's making pulp for cardboard. And while the need for paper is plummeting, the need for cardboard is skyrocketing. Why? Once again, because of the internet. Because we order everything online today from Amazon, from Zalando, and it's being shipped to us in cardboard boxes. So the internet really is changing everything. And it has been doing it for quite a while, and it's just getting faster and faster. 
But sometimes I do wonder where we're going. Now we at F-Secure, we're not a startup. I don't even know why we are here because we are far from startup. We've been around forever. I've been working with this company since 1991. The company is 26 years old. This is our headquarters in Ruoholahti, in Helsinki. This is our Asian headquarters and right next to Kuala Lumpur and we run global labs around the world trying to stop online attacks, including malware attacks. And in fact, we do receive every single day on average, 250,000 malware samples to be analyzed in our systems. Mostly Windows malware, but we do already receive around 9,000 Android samples to be analyzed every single day. 9,000 Android samples every single day. And we do this with our data centers located around the world, roughly 750 servers which run our system which receives customer queries on the average of two and a half billion queries every day. So we run a sizable operation, but we do try to run parts of our operations in this startup fashion. So for example, our new mobile hybrid VPN solution for iPhones and Androids, Freedom, was separated, sort of separated from the big company and run in a startup fashion. And it has been a great success. We're very happy to see that. So how do we solve this problem of online attacks and malware? Well, of course, open source should be one solution, right? We can fix the internet if we go away from closed source and closed technologies and go to open source. Maybe. However, if you look at what's been happening earlier this year, we had first Heartbleed, and then we had, uh, right after Heartbleed, Shellshock. These are both major vulnerabilities found from open source systems. Heartbleed from open SSL encryption libraries, Shellshock from the Bash command shell. They, are, they were both ancient, absolutely ancient. When Heartbleed vulnerability was found from the OpenSSL libraries, it had been around for two and a half years. Even worse, when Shellshock was found, we realized that it had been around for 19 years. 19, that's one nine. 19 years and nobody noticed. How the heck is this even possible? Wasn't it so that open source has less security vulnerabilities because anybody can look at the source code and find these vulnerabilities and fix them. Well, apparently, it isn't happening. It should be happening, but it isn't happening. And sometimes, it does feel like we've built a monster. A great example on the implications of these vulnerabilities is that, for example, OpenSSL is used everywhere. It's used in various online services, on various high-profile websites. It's used in the Internet of Things. It's used in different devices. It's used in routers. For example, Gmail is encrypted with OpenSSL. So you would think that this library, which was an open source project, would be a professional project. But the truth is that it was maintained by three guys, guys whose budget for 2013 was $2,500. So we are running our critical infrastructure with these projects with no manpower and no funding. Sometimes it does feel like we've built a monster. So what else can we do to fix the internet? Well, well one great innovation from roughly five years ago, which has great excitement in the air, is these new currencies, which are not based on anything else except math and crypto. So currencies based on math, currencies based on cryptography. Bitcoin, Litecoin, Namecoin, PPC coin, Doggy coin. And these are interesting because they do open up completely new opportunities. But what's quite surprising is that when you look at what these new currencies have created is that they've created a massive competition on who can mine most currencies and create the largest data centers to actually create new currencies. Now, those of you who work with cryptocurrencies know that mining is actually confirming transactions. So it's not really wasted work. 
but it does make me wonder how, just, how, just how much work we put into mining for Bitcoin and related currencies. Just the Bitcoin network in its computing power is ridiculously large. Ridiculously large. So who has the fastest supercomputers on the planet? Who has the largest network of data centers? Who has the largest combined computing power? Is it Google? No. Amazon? No. NSA? No, we don't think so. We think the fastest combined computing power is the Bitcoin network. In fact, the Bitcoin network is faster than the fastest supercomputer in the world. It's faster than the 500 top supercomputers combined. It's almost 300 times faster than the top 500 supercomputers combined in computing power. Does that make any sense? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. And that's largely created with, with purpose-built mining hardware like this. This is from a company called Cowboy Miner, a unit called SP30. Here's an example of a data center which was built with those devices. Roughly three and a half million dollars invested in building a high-end supercomputing center for one purpose, for mining bitcoins. Of course, these devices can easily overheat. This particular data center was running in Thailand, and they did have a slight overheating problem last month. And it turns out they weren't even insured, so it was a complete write-off. Sometimes it does feel like we've built a monster. And attacks against cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and related currencies are various. Of course, we see theft of virtual currencies because it's basically like stealing cash. But it's even more interesting when the attackers go mining by themselves. So they realize that if they can convert computing power into cash, that computing power doesn't have to be your own computing power. You don't have to run your own data center. You can just infect other people, other people's computers, and use their combined computing power to do the mining for you. What's even more interesting in that attack is that the attack is no longer targeting the user of the computers. It's targeting the computer itself. So the computer targeted doesn't need a traditional user at all. It can be something like this. It can be the Internet of Things. The computer is embedded in our appliances, in our cars, in our washing machines. We've had very few credible threat scenarios for devices like that. Like, who wants to infect toasters? Beats me. However, if you can infect a million toasters and combine the calculation power of that network, you can use it to make money. And this isn't just theory. We've actually found the first botnet built from security cameras using the combined power of those security cameras to make money with mining. The headline here gets it wrong, though. They weren't mining for Bitcoin because the Bitcoin difficulty is skyrocketing. They were actually mining for Dokicoin in here, which is much, much easier to mine. Nevertheless, sometimes it does feel like we've built a monster. And then we have the problems coming from the government. Of course, the NSA, the Snowden revelations, and of course, what Russia is doing right, right now, especially inside Ukraine, with targeted espionage attacks like Cosmic Duke and uh, Sandworm and so on. Governments have become one of the main sources of new malware. One recent example is what's been happening over the last six weeks in Hong Kong. We've all heard about the riots, people demanding their rights on the streets of Hong Kong. These riots are organized by a handful of volunteer organizations. And one of these organizations was organizing, organizing these events through the internet and through mobile phones. Of course, that's how you organize things today. That's how Slush was organized through the net. And they actually sent this message through WhatsApp to people who wanted to participate in these demonstrations. We shouldn't really call them riots. They were demonstrations. The problem, though, is that this WhatsApp message was not 
sent by these organizers. This WhatsApp message was actually sent from Beijing. We believe it was sent by the Chinese government. And the application you got to your Android or iPhone by following this link was a real application which could be used to communicate with other protesters and do organized protests. Unfortunately, it also collected your contacts from your phone and it collected your location and sent them to mainland China. By building the internet, we've built the perfect tool for the surveillance state. Through the internet, hostile governments can monitor what we do, where we are, who do we communicate with, even what we think. And sometimes it does feel like we've built a monster. The traditional enemies that we face in our daily fight are the criminals who do their attacks to make money, the hacktivists who want to protest, and then the governmental attacks. However, we might right now be seeing a fourth group emerging. And that fourth group could be terrorists. And when I say terrorists, I mean real world terror groups who now might be gaining the capability of doing online attacks instead of real world attacks. And this is a new development. I did a lengthy study into this three years ago and then my outcome was that we, this is a problem we don't have to worry about yet. But this might now be changing. And one example I can give to you on this is this hacker that we were tracking in United Kingdom two years ago. A guy who called himself Trick. His real name was Unite Hussein. He was running this online hacker collective loosely connected to Anonymous. They did several fairly mainstream attacks, mostly distributed denial of service attacks to shut down websites, also defacements against mainstream websites to get visibility for their attacks. I guess their biggest thing was that they hacked the voicemail of Tony Blair and leaked his voicemail messages online. And this particular hack actually cost the leader of the gang, Trick, aka Junaid Hussein, to be caught, to be taken into a court in UK and sentenced. He was sentenced to one and a half years in jail. However, before he started his jail sentence, he disappeared. He bailed. We lost track of him. We had no idea where he was for a year until this summer when he found him again. And when, he, when we found him again, he wasn't in UK. He was in Syria. He had joined the ISIS. And you can now find him from the ISIS Twitter feeds posting threatening tweets against the UK government and the US government and basically any other government they have a beef with. And he's not alone. We actually have an, a series of examples of hackers who have joined ISIS. So for the first time, we actually might have to start worrying about terror attacks online. We aren't there yet, but clearly the situation isn't getting better. It's getting worse. And what I do worry about is that we are the people who've lived through this great revolution, the revolution of the internet. In future history books, these decades will be described as the time as we, the mankind, got online. The internet was created, the web was created, the web and the internet which brought us so much good, so much connectivity, so much business, so much entertainment. But I'm worried that if we don't take care of the internet, if we don't actively fight against these various problems that we are seeing right now, we might not have an internet left to give to our children. So please join me in keeping the internet free and open for the future generations. Thank you very much.